This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Ariel Horn, D, 5, 0. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Ariel Horn, one of the contributors to YoungJustice.tv, a fan-run website about all things Young Justice. Over on their site, they cover everything from news and reviews to rumors and fan movements. And outside of her YJ articles, Ariel is also a writer of both fan fiction and her own original work. And we're so excited to have her on the show today. Ariel, welcome to Whelmed. Thanks so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. <laughs> it's, I can't wait. I cannot wait for this discussion. <laughs> I know. I've been waiting for it for weeks and I'm like, all right, I'm pumped. Here we go. <laughs> Time to cry. <laughs> <laughs> But before we begin, I want to remind everyone listening at home that our discussion episodes do draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including episodes 1 through 13 of season 3, the comics, and the video game. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do out in the world? Yeah, for sure. But it's not nearly as interesting as most of your other guests. So. <laughs> I'm sure you, everyone is interesting. Everyone is interesting in their own way. In their own way. All right. So by day, I work as a project manager at a translation company, which sounds very fancy. But essentially what I do is I coordinate and I handle translations for the Social Security Administration, which is really cool in its own right. But it's a lot of uh, busy work and I handle a lot of languages. And then by night, I am a writer and I can usually be found at Panera, um, you know, lurking, chugging my weight in broccoli cheddar soup, you know, disturbing everyone with my disgruntled expressions and why won't this come out? <laughs> um, so between the two, it basically means I'm always kind of connected to some kind of screen, which comes for par when you're a writer, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're always, you're always doing something. But okay, this is just a curious me question. How many languages do you speak if you're a translator? So I actually, it may have come out wrong. It's one of the most common questions I have. I am not actually a translator. I am like the middleman. I work uh -huh. with the translators and with the client to just it, make and deliver translations. Um, so personally, I speak three languages. I speak English, uh, Hebrew, and a little bit of Spanish. But I work with almost every language in the world. Like <laughs> something from like German to Tagalog to Maltese, to like languages that you've never even heard of. And it's great because I prefer the exotic languages because it makes my job a lot easier when I can't read what's on the screen. Because <laughs> I'm like, okay, this looks pretty much the same. We got it. It's good. I I'm just passing it <laughs> to go. No, th that's serious. That is super cool. You're saying you're not cool. That is really <laughs> cool. I, s I speak one language, maybe. Uh <laughs> But building off of all of that, how did you end up writing for the YoungJustice.tv site? So I actually really love this question because I get it a lot. Um, and people assume that it was a lot harder than it was. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what it happened was it was in December and it was during the time where it, we were like a month out from the new season of Young Justice. And yeah. it was when they were releasing like all those like, you know, the sneak peeks and the spoilers and the trailers and such. And I was like, I need to talk about this with other people aside from the two people that watch Young Justice. <laughs> if they hear anything else, they might actually choke me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, new people alert. Uh, I'm going to join the Young Justice Discord. And Eric, who is the manager of the website, um, he was part of it. And I saw him there. And I was like, hmm, okay, this is a new website. It wasn't really on my like radar before I joined the YJ Discord. And I guess, I don't know what happened, but it was maybe it was because of all this hype, you know, the six year hype and like seeing all these press reviews and all these articles coming out. And I was like, 
I need to write about this show immediately <laughs> and I need to find out a way. How do I do it? Okay, so like some switch flicked in my mind, which is super weird because I'm not usually this type of like go-getter person, but I decided to like throw caution to the wind and like, you know what? I'm going to message him on Discord and see what he has to say. So I was like, hello, do you need any new writers or like content creators for your website? Because I'm here, I am willing, let's do this. And he was like, do you have any professional experience? And I was like, does fan fiction count? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. Yes. <laughs> no, um, you know, here's where like I insert my lament of why on earth did I major in psychology instead of English, which is what I'm actually good at. <laughs> but I was like, no, I don't have any experience, but I can give you a trial run and I will spit a review out for you. And he was like, okay, why don't you do like a test trial and we'll see how it goes. And I was like, great. Coincidentally, I was, you know, in my YJ binge of rewatching everything before season three, and I just seen um, Happy New Year uh, again. So I was like, I'm going to read about that because that's still fresh in my head. And I did it, and I sent it to him, and it was just a banter of a couple of weeks. And before I knew it, I had my press credentials, and there we go. And I was working for the website, and it's fantastic. That is, on- that is fantastic, honestly. Here, here at Whelmed, we call that participating. You went out, you participated, and good things happened because that's what they do. Uh, no, that's awesome. And of course, we all start somewhere. Like, right. yeah, you didn't have any professional experience before, and now you do. You have to start oh, somewhere. <laughs> and it's great. It's great. It's fantastic. So going off of that, when did you first see Young Justice? Was it on when they were on DVD? Did you watch it on Netflix? Or were you? did you watch it part of the original run? Or... Yeah, so I started with the original run, but it's actually really funny because I I don't know any other fan who started the show like I have because I actually, the first episode I watched was Failsafe. Um, really? <laughs> yes, yes. I don't know any other fan who has watched the show like I have because Just I, jumping into the <laughs> middle, jump right into the into, deep end on this show. The worst episode to get into, right? Um, so what happened was I had this friend and she was like oh my god you have to watch this show this is the best show ever like I promise and I was like superheroes I don't love (laughs) superheroes like I have no history with like comics cartoons I know like you know I know Batman I know Superman but I was like it's not for me never been interested except for Teen Titans of course that was like Teen Titans Um, but other (laughs) than that right uh I was like no, 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 I don't think so. And she's like, no, 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 listen, okay, no, you you don't understand. There was this episode and everyone has been traumatized by this episode because it was all a dream and everyone was dying and like you have, and I was like, well, emotional trauma, okay. Because if there's something you need to know about me, I love things with emotional trauma in them. Like (laughs) sad endings, oh my God, I can't. They just, they they fill my heart and bring me joy. (laughs) So I was like, okay, I'll watch it with you. So we started with Failsafe. And then from then on, it was basically jumping around to like different episodes. In it was during like that first hiatus. I, I, I think it was the first hiatus uh, with Young Justice. It was before Misplaced had come out. Because Misplaced was the first episode that I watched with everyone else on Cartoon so Network. So I, I think that was actually the second hiatus. Well, there we had go. a lot of hiatuses back <laughs> right. in the day. Because, like, the first one was the first one that came back after the first hiatus was was uh, Targets. So, Failsafe was a little farther down the line. But, yeah, one of the many hiatuses of season one. You, ju- you like, watched the whole, everything that was available at that point, you watched, like, over one of the hiatuses. Right. Yep, that's pretty much it. And it was really funny because one of my fondest memories, because I was watching all these episodes out of order because she would just, she would sell me based on the plots. She'd be like, oh, this happened and this happened. And then I remember... Um, I hadn't yet watched Targets, but (laughs) I had already, I don't know, I don't even remember how, but I'd already fallen in love with both Roy and Jade as characters, probably because I'd gone and done like research about them on my own after seeing them in the show. And then I was like, and then I found out about this episode and I was like, excuse me, Serena, this episode (laughs) is a Roy and Jade episode and a Super Martian episode and you didn't (laughs) tell me and it was like like 8 a.m at the time like mind you and I was like we need to watch this right now like I can't believe that you wouldn't show me this ahead of time but yeah so that is one of my fondest memories (laughs) watching the first season and watching 
I love it. I absolutely love it. The best way to get someone into a show, shipping and emotional trauma. Uh, Of course. (laughs) At least for me, anyway. (laughs) And speaking of emotional trauma, the weirdest segue I can make, but it (laughs) makes perfect sense. We'll get there. Uh, When we were talking, when we first started talking about you coming on the show, one of the topics that came up was our mutual love of how Young Justice handles really emotional scenes. Mm. Uh, Because like, we love the action and we love the adventure and all that. But it's so good when this show kind of slows down and makes us cry for a bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so okay. let's let's dive more into that. Uh, and finding out that that's what got you into the show <laughs> is incredible, honestly. So what are some of your favorite emotional scenes from Young Justice for you personally? Oof. So like everyone who's ever been on my Tumblr will already know this. But the biggest gut punch for me was absolutely that Will and Jade scene in Exceptional Human Beings. Cause I was sitting there, I, so what happened, it was really funny because Eric, he gets to watch them before I do. Cause I'm at work when they, usually the press screeners are released. So he'll watch them and he'll give me like a little heads up, like in case anything good happens. Um, and he was like, I was just sitting at work and I was like, Hey, how, how was the episode? And he's like, Oh, Jade's in it. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> But she was just in triptych. I wasn't expecting to see Jade again so soon. And he's like, oh, and Will. And I'm like, what? (laughs) There's what? Both of them together? And he's like, yeah, they're having a discussion. Oh, no, but she's not staying. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Like, this was the last 15 minutes of work, too. So I was like, zoom onto my press account. Like, I need to watch this. I can't even leave work without, like, having watching this. And I was watching it. And it was basically, like, being stabbed in the chest repeatedly um it was everything i ever could have wished for in a scene with them and it's it's honestly one of the most perfect scenes of young justice in my opinion because there's so many layers and so much is going on um but that scene has traumatized me the most out of this entire series but i (laughs) i hilariously had a had a similar experience in that uh rich my wonderful co-host and our amazing uh, editor and producer, Neil, saw that episode before me because they were on DC Daily that week and they got to see it a couple of days before it was aired. Uh, And so after they had seen it, I got a message that was something along the lines of like, you're you're gonna like one of the (laughs) upcoming episodes. And they were like, we can't tell you why, because you (laughs) haven't seen it yet and we don't want to spoil it. Yeah. But there's some stuff. And then after I saw it and messaged them and was like, guys, Will and Will and Jade, they're making me sad. They were like, yep, no, when that happened while we were watching it, we both just immediately looked at each other and went, oh, they've killed Emily. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, after I watched that episode, see, like, I, I couldn't spoil anything for anyone, of course, but I called, I had to call one of my, like, best friends, and I was, like, almost crying to her on the phone. I was like, I can't tell you what happened, but something <laughs> happened, and I'm like, it hurts so much. And You're like, I need, I need to process, but I can't tell anyone. <laughs> I can't tell anyone, but I was like, you'll, you'll see, like, you'll see what happens. And it's it's all gonna make sense on Friday. <laughs> uh, but yeah. other than yes. Will and Jade breaking our hearts, what are what are yeah. some of your other faves? Oh, definitely the Super Martian talk from Depths because uh, uh. ooh <laughs> ooh yes oh I mean obviously the entirety of failsafe and disorder and the the therapy scenes from Disorder those are big uh, those are fantastic. Um. Roy, the original Roy's emotional outburst in Satisfaction. Which he, one? The one where he <laughs> just about screams at Ollie. Um, and he's like, to Will, he's like, no, no, like, I don't blame you. Which is really interesting because basically that was everything that Will, he, he knew, he thought that like Roy was going to hate him this entire time because he'd stolen him. And then it was like, bam, plot twist. He doesn't. He hates Ollie. Ching. <laughs> you know? Um, yes. Basically, any Zatanna Zatara scene that's ever come up, you know, from both misplaced and private security. Uh, yeah, there's a yeah. bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, I need to count. There, there are. This show, this show hurts us, and it's fine. It's, it's fine. fine. We're fine with it. I, I want to cry over a superhero cartoon every day. It's great. <laughs> great. <laughs> it's great because when I tell my mother, I'm like. Mom, you don't understand. Like this, like I'm in such. I can't do anything. I've just watched these episodes, and I need to like take 
17 hours and process them. <laughs> I'm just, I'm a ball of emotion. Uh, that's, that's what we are. But we, we do, we do recordings where we're just like, we just need to process our feelings for a minute here. <laughs> yes. Uh, but going off of that, let's talk a little bit about like how we build these scenes as writers. Cause you're a writer. I am a writer. Uh, we both we've both written fan fiction. We've both written our own original stuff, and it can be so difficult for writers to figure out how to create something that has that kind of emotional reaction from an audience. So, what do you think are some of the ways that Young Justice specifically works to make these scenes work for us, rather than just having them be kind of like these little dramatic plot points that we forget about? There's stuff that sticks with us, right? <laughs> so. Essentially, it all boils down to everyone who's writing Young Justice is brilliant because they True. all, yes, so they all follow this structure and there's so many points required to make an emotional scene. So in order to have an emotional scene that lasts with the audience, it either has to propel the story forward or be aligned with the story without breaking away from it, which is basically the entirety of both fail-safe and disordered because it's part of the main story and it does help propel the plot forward without, you know, taking away, taking us away. It's not like a general filler episode that you'll forget about, obviously, because everyone is probably still crying about sales <laughs> <laughs> and thinking about it. Because uh-huh. the light isn't involved in that episode at all. We don't see any of that. Nope. We just see the team having an emotional breakdown while we can do nothing about it. Right. It's great. I loved watching that episode, knowing everything that was going to happen. And I was like, ah, I see why <laughs> I've been so traumatized <laughs> about this. And that's and that's so interesting, especially since Failsafe was your first episode uh, of watching it. And like, do you, did that, that episode still hit you as hard, like without knowing who these characters were and everything? Like you were just ready to go with it? Or did like your friend fill you in on everything beforehand? Yes, yeah, it filled me in to what I... <laughs> It did not hit me at heart, like as hard because I knew everything. I was like, yes, this is all a dream, but I get it. And let me tell you, my favorite part of that episode and it, what it's another thing of what makes Young Justice's emotional scenes so brilliant. Um, it's the multi-layered approach. So you don't just have the story. You don't just have the background of the characters. You also have like these other elements like music plot setting animation voice acting so like the moment that will always hit me in the gut every time donica mckeller's uh scream um of artists i i don't know anyone who has not been personally attacked by that scream (laughs) yeah that didn't hit you i'd probably call you a liar because it's just so gut-wrenching and emotional I completely agree. Like when I was reading over some of your notes beforehand and you mentioned that as something you wanted to talk about, I would just like it immediately played through my head. It was like, oh yeah, that yeah, that, that, one. that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and you can picture it so clearly in your mind. It doesn't matter if you yes. watch it once, twice, a million, it's still there. Yeah, I was like, I haven't watched Failsafe in, in months. Oh, that's still right there, right on the surface. <laughs> We can pull that up at any moment. Um, But what are some of your other things that you think help build these scenes really well? Yes. um, The characters. uh, Yes. The audience. It doesn't matter if it's in writing a book, uh, fan fiction, a TV show, a movie. Your audience has to connect with the characters in some kind of way. Um, To the point, it doesn't matter if they're good characters, bad characters. You need to feel that emotional connection in order to even give a hoot about what's going on in the scene. Um, so what's amazing about Young Justice is that they have this really strong characterization, especially in season one. So you have this team who we've been getting to know and love over X amount of episodes. And we know them so well as if they're, you know, I can relate to Artemis too, because who doesn't have secrets that they're hiding and who feels insecure? And, yeah. you know, we can relate to again because she just wants to be everyone's friend and she's so <laughs> nice. And then when you put these characters in a scene that just takes you and wrenches your gut, like, for example, the Zatanna Zatara scene in Private Security, 
you know, we know Satana, we're rooting for her. She's this cool, generally chill kind of person. And then we put her in a reunion with her father, who she hasn't seen. Well, she sees him once a year for an hour. Um, (laughs) And then you're like left in a puddle of tears on the floor. (laughs) Yeah. You build these connections with these characters and then seeing them being hurt, you're just like, ah, my empathy. No. (laughs) Yeah. And then following up on that, something that I recently discovered while I was doing my research for this podcast and something that Young Justice does pretty much in almost every single emotional scene, there's like a a matter of answering questions that the audience has in these scenes. And it's like, if you think about it, for example, going back to the Zatanna Zatara scene, like you wonder, I know it was a popular audience question, like, what is the deal with Zatara? Like, what's going on? Is she ever going to save him? And it's like, aha, now we know that they see each other once a year. And, or for example, Homefront, where we were like, so what's the deal with Artemis and Cheshire? What is the deal with Artemis's, like, you know, insecurity? Where, where her family back? And it's like, haha, her sister abandoned her because her dad was emotionally and physically abusive in the sense that he trained them from when they were very young. Yeah. So there's always a matter of either answering a question that the audience have and then bringing up more questions after the scene to get you hooked on like, but what comes next? Yeah. Like, uh, I know for, for me as a fan watching season two for the first time, so many of those early episodes were me being like, okay, but, but how did Connor and McGann break up? And then they tell you how Connor and McGann broke up. And it's like, I have an answer, but it hurts more. (laughs) Uh, Cause that scene is so well put together of giving you information of like, we've, of keeping you guessing for just long enough that they get when they give you the answer, you're like, I almost wish I didn't know the answer because now it just hurts. Because <laughs> those like little more slings of information, like in episode one of season two, you have, oh, they're broken up and McGann is dating McGann. Uh, McGann is dating Lagan. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have that. Really? Why? <laughs> I, um, and then there's that whole conversation in Earthlings where Connor's like, she didn't break up with me. I broke up with her. And then you're like, excuse me? Um, <laughs> why? And then you have that culmination in depths where they have that argument. It's like, Whew, all right. So we have our why, but now what's going to happen with them? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then going from there, I think we we talked a little bit about how like these scenes can give you like a different perspective on something you hadn't seen before. Mm-hmm. Do you want to like go into that? Yes. So what's great about all these different emotional scenes is that usually it it builds on the characterization and kind of gives us this unexpected angle that we may not have seen before. Like can can we just talk about for a second how Jade started off as this, you know, teasing like catty villain who is constantly one-upping everyone in season one and now in season three she's crying as she leaves her potentially ex-husband and wants to see her daughter because that that's called character development and it's fantastic and then i think about that every day (laughs) way too often for my own good (laughs) and then but like leaving jade aside there's also like, for, like I mentioned before, with Roy in Satisfaction, how, you know, Will, Will was worried all this time that Roy is going to hate him because he is his clone and he's taking over his life. And Roy's like, no, no, I, I don't blame you because you're just a clone and you didn't do anything wrong. But I actually blame my mentor because he should have been the one to find me. And then one of my favorite examples is in Failsafe at the end, you, you know, with McGann and Connor together, you would expect Connor to be the one comforting her after this, you know, emotional trauma that she essentially caused um but instead it's captain marvel that's holding her and it's like oh well this hurts even more because that moment once i once you brought that up like i started thinking about it i was like i have never like stopped to consider how much of an interesting choice that is at the end of fail safe because you're completely right you assume that that should be connor Mm -hmm. but and like i think part of my mind is like Oh, well, Captain Marvel was just closer. But the more you think about it, you're like, no, like Connor's going through some stuff in that moment. I'm not sure like Connor is even emotionally prepared to be like, oh, I have to comfort someone. No, I'm I'm broken, too, right now. And it's like, 
you know, it just makes you think twice because it's like, oh, that's such an odd choice that Captain Marvel will be the one hugging her. And then it's interesting because then you also realize like a few episodes later, it's like, oh, he's a little boy. <laughs> it's a whole new layer to the, you know, to the story. Absolutely. Uh, and like with Failsafe in particular, we talk a lot on the show. We have talked a lot on the show about how Failsafe is so interesting as an emotional episode because there are consequences because failsafe doesn't just go away right on a lot of other shows something like failsafe that had that much happen would just kind of disappear like oh it was a dream sequence we're not going to talk about it everybody's fine because it wasn't real Mm -hmm. whereas young justice is like no this felt real and everybody needs some therapy (laughs) in the words of uh doom patrol it's like yes therapy therapy let's (laughs) Um, is that the the new Doom Patrol on uh, DC Universe? Yes, which is such a fantastic show, amazing. So I have heard lots of good things, though I have not had the chance to sit down and watch it yet. Really get on that because that's. <laughs> <laughs> but go, uh, yes, consequences. So you you realize that there are no such thing as filler episodes in Young Justice because anything that even looks like a filler guess what? It's not. Like, downtime, you know, downtime, we think that's a kind of filler episode, because you get to see, like, little glimpses into the home lives of everyone, except not when you realize that they're stealing the Starotech creature from, you know, from Calder's home, and that's going to be crucial to the plot in developing the Starotech, which is going to, you know, incapacitate the Justice League in the finale. (laughs) So guess what? There are no fillers in Young Justice because everything has a consequence. And you soon come to realize that with all these scenes, nothing is ever brushed aside. If it's brought up, it's always going to culminate in some kind of ending or choice that may or not, may not be a good thing for the characters. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's that, it's that way where everything, everything matters. They don't waste any space in telling the story that we we talk about a lot considering how there are hints about the end of season two in the f- first episode of season one uh like that is how much detail is put into this show everything matters right um so like i don't know if you've seen greg posted on twitter a while back he's like ah oh, yes now that i have some free time time to work on the young justice timeline and it's like these hundreds and hundreds of pages so rest is- <laughs> Everything is in there. Everything has a point. Nothing is yeah. or done for no reason. This isn't Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I'm not still salty or anything. We're, we're not going to go anywhere near that. <laughs> Keeping it positive here on Whelmed. Uh, but yes, I have, I have seen uh, what Greg Weissman was talking about, about the timeline and how if I'm remembering correctly, it was over 300 pages for the Young Justice timeline before yep. adding anything from season three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm like, that's, that is so intense. Amazing. And and it pays off so well, not just with the plot and not just with like the actual events happening, but with mm-hmm. these emotional scenes, because having that much detail put into like what these characters are doing outside of being crying teenagers means that when they are crying teenagers, we care that much more. <laughs> right. Oof, what I wouldn't give to read that entire outline, right? Right. It's like there, there, there's got to be something in there that we don't know, like things that they've worked out that we just haven't seen. I would, <laughs> that would be amazing. No doubt that there's things in there that'll finally answer all my deepest, darkest questions. <laughs> maybe, maybe someday, maybe someday okay. they'll right a tell all. I, d- I doubt it, considering how much how how s- much they guard spoilers over there at mm. the Young Justice team. But who knows? Maybe, maybe someday, <laughs> far in the future, we yeah. can all get a glimpse at what the timeline was. Right. Um, but I want to loop back around for a second mm-hmm. and let's talk about Jade. Because oh. <laughs> I love Jade. You also love Jade. Yes. Uh, when we when the first trailer for season three was released, the oh. thing 
I probably screamed the most at was there was one shot of Cheshire in it. And I immediately, as soon as it dropped, was just like messaging uh, our whole Whelm team and was like, Cheshire's in season three. We've got confirmation that Cheshire's in season three. I know there are other things happening, but Cheshire, we didn't know she'd be around. I'll take it a step further because I did that. And then someone on Tumblr, incorrectly at the time, they pointed out, oh my God, Cheshire's wearing pants this season. Like full pants. <laughs> Like, and I was like, you know, back then I was, you know, I was so naive and innocent. I was like, I think she's wearing pants because she's a mother now and she's a, and she's probably doing her own thing and she's going to be a little more close. No, <laughs> she, first of all, she's not wearing pants. Second of all, she's not with her husband and child. She's causing me heartache. <laughs> Mur- murder mom's off doing, doing her own thing and we're all worried about her. But I do think that's hilarious that we as a fandom, because uh, I've done it too. I've been known to do it too. We'll see like a slight costume change and be like, okay, what does this mean about character development? I, I, at the time, I was kind of like, well, why does she only get pants? Everyone else got like a new uniform. Jane deserves a new uniform too. She's been wearing this for what, six years? It's about time. Like, let's give mama a new kick butt kind of clothes. But that's my um, my Jane loving heart for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm right there with you. I'm I'm the person who like watches the end of season two and I'm like, why didn't we bring Cheshire in to help save the world? I know she's a villain, but like <laughs> like I'm like, I know logically it doesn't make any sense, but I, could we have Jade here? <laughs> I mean, but at the same time, you know that she was calmly at home with Leon. Like, don't worry. If this all goes to like poop, we'll we'll, we'll- <laughs> At least we're going to be together. And she's just chilling at home, you know? Like, it's fine. I don't I get paid enough fine. for this. <laughs> <laughs> but I think part of the reason that we and so many other people love Cheshire as a character is because of that character development that she goes over these three seasons these two and a half seasons that we have so far from like her first introduction being like oh she's a cool fun like jokey assassin i'm here for that that'll be fun and then over the course of three seasons you're like oh no you have some emotional trauma to work through that please please go to therapy jade (laughs) i need you to go to therapy (laughs) Um, uh, like I know me and Rich have both talked about how we would absolutely love just another therapy episode. We are always down for like Black Canary just sitting people down and being like, let's talk through your super powered emotions. Oh, yes. Like, can we can we get that for Jade? We probably won't. But I want her to be a stable human being who loves her family and can be with them. Yeah. So Jade is just fantastic. Like, I, I'm not a big fan of comics, Jade, um, just because, uh, you know, I, I'm not liking the direction that they went with her in some stories, but Young Justice, like, I am full in, die hard, I love it. Like, she, and she starts off as this, like, you know, cocky woman who's, like, always one-upping everyone, but then over, even over the course of season one, we learn, wait, there's definitely more to her, and then she starts someone who's, like, every woman for herself, or every girl for herself, Uh, and then at the, you know, and then season two, it's like, bam, just kidding, I have a baby, and I actually really love her, except I also take her on dangerous missions to to Tibet, but that's because I care so much about her, and I don't want to let her out of my sight. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's <But> like <laughs> the the skewed form of of just this is how i keep a child safe i'm the only one who can keep this child safe but it's like it also offers an interesting way you got to think about that during this uh this time where she was gone from will roy she was like <laughs> like you got to think that she was probably on her guard constantly watching over leon because she's probably terrified that yeah. Someone will find because she did betray the shadows, as we find out in Young Justice Legacy. And you got to think she was probably staying on the DL, but also trying to help her husband in finding Roy. So she's keeping her daughter with her, probably most of the time, if not handing her off to her mother, because we do know that they share some kind of um, relationship. And yeah, I mean, she's a very protective mom. Yeah. 
It's one of it's one of those ways where like that works as a great joke in that episode, but it also tells you so much about who Jade is as a person uh, and how we are able to, through scenes like that, get from the point of like season one. I'm like, oh, her and Red Arrow are fun and flirty and I, I ship it to like season three where legitimately they're seen outside uh, in <laughs> in that one episode where he like tilts her head up and just is like, no, you should come inside. Like I like started tearing up. I was like, what do you mean I'm tearing up about these two? I no, they're they're the fun, flirty superhero, supervillain ship. No, what is happening here? But it works so well. It feels earned at this point in season three because of the way the show handles these moments. Yes, I just only wish, my only regret is that there wasn't an outlet to see more of how their relationship developed going from yeah. one forced kiss episode, what was it, 23? Yeah, insecurity, whatever number episode that is. <laughs> you know, that's how I today. Um, but yeah, going from that one to seeing how, like, we get these little bits from YJL, but we slowly learned that they work really well together as a team. And we see that in Bloodlines. We see that they, they have a pretty good camaraderie because they were together looking for the original Roy for so long. And they fight pretty well together, too. And then we go to season three where he knows her well enough to a know that she's lurking outside b he knows just what to say to her too because he's not like he's not even angry with her at this point which is amazing but also completely understandable because he knows who she is he knows her decisions and he's like will you just please come inside i know this isn't you you're here for a reason i know you well enough to know that and even when she tries i mean i've analyzed this scene so many times but she (laughs) in case you couldn't tell um he's constantly looking away from him and like trying not to own up and then he just tilts her chin up breaking that and he's like nah i'm not gonna let you do this you're going to look at me and like face what you're doing and then To me, one of the most interesting parts of that scene is that she basically runs away at the end of the confrontation, which is very not Jade-like because Jade is like Cheshire. She slinks away. She's always calm and composed. Nope. She is crying and basically dashing as fast as she can away from her ex-husband. I'm saying ex. I don't want (laughs) I'm gonna hope I'm just gonna say husband from now on they're still married they don't have the (laughs) divorce (laughs) it's it's fine everything's fine uh but before we descend fully into just (laughs) doing the Cheshroy super sweethearts that I need to tackle what are some of the other characters that you think facilitate these scenes really well yeah besides besides everybody's favorite murder mom (laughs) so I think the two best characters for these emotional scenes are actually Artemis and Calder, which is very interesting considering the the two unique iterations that belong to Young Justice. And why do you, why do you think that those two work so well? Like, I, I agree with you. I think both of them have such interesting scenes like Artemis with Jade and Calder dealing with like Black Manta. But why do you think that is with the two of them? I think it has to do with a lack of canon comic history. Like, you know, everyone knows Robin's backstory about the circus and that how his entire family died there, almost his entire family, um, at least Young Justice. Um, But everyone knows that and everyone knows Wally and you know Zatanna and you know um, Superboy, but Calder and Artemis are very unique characters to Young Justice in that they took them and they made them completely their own. Like, of course, Aqualad exists and Artemis Croc does exist in comic canon, but not Young Justice's version of them. And then they give them their own complicated backstories and lives. And we're always like, because the audience doesn't know these characters, well, now they do, but they did (laughs) season one. They're like, oh, what are you doing with them? Oh, this is interesting. Let's find out some more. So when it's Artemis, you have the whole thing, like going back to season one, episode six, it's like, what is her connection with Cheshire? And then you learn, aha, Cheshire is her sister. Oh, wait, Cheshire and her father 
and her mother were all were all super villains not in the case of paula anymore but you know and sportsmasters still are and then they keep developing this family dynamic and the fact that now everyone loves to see them all on screen together <laughs> to the point you know with the tr- photos it's like yay we get jade and her dad back like awesome we're rooting for these you know family characters that we just love so much because they've developed from this unique iteration. I I totally agree. It lets you have that kind of having that blank slate means that they're a little bit less burdened by like the decades of history that some of the other characters have where going into those storylines like you expect something from Dick Grayson whereas Artemis especially in season 1 we all went and we're like I don't know what's going to happen to you. I don't know who these people are in your backstory and once the show shows you of like oh this is her relationship with your sister you're like oh now i care and now i care deeply and personally in this version of this character rather than comparing them to like other versions of that character right and then i think it's also kind of a shame in calder's front because calder isn't talked about as much as like everyone else on the team which is really unfortunate because he's pretty emotionally traumatized from everything in season two as well. Cause you have to consider it. He lost Tula decided to go undercover when he decided, when he discovered that black Manta was in fact, his father went undercover, did a whole bunch of questionable and reg- regrettable choices brought Artemis into this as well. So we have this entire spree of the two of them, you know, acting as villains for a, big chunk of season two and then at the end dick is like here you go have a team (laughs) you don't need a therapy session with black mary you're fine here's the team back i'm suffering too right and i think it's so interesting and tells us so much about both of their characters and the way that the end of season two hits them because wally's death hurt all of us so much um but it shows us so much about like who Calder is as a person that Calder deals with that kind of tragedy by being like, no, I need to get back to work. I need to get back to doing good things. Right. Whereas Nightwing is like, I need to walk away for a bit. Uh, <laughs> not that long since season two, since season three happened and we see that he's back right. to doing all of this two years later. But he he needs a break, whereas Calder being the type of emotional character that he is is like no i need to be doing good work again as soon as possible after everything i went through and then i mean in my opinion dick probably needs some therapy as well right now because he has <laughs> been like this well i mean he's going and calling will wally because that was a stab to the gut and you really Ooh. dick's also not okay yeah and it's probably not the last we've heard of it we're probably gonna see some more i I theorize that we're probably going to see some more of both Artemis and Dick grieving Wally in the latter half of season three. That could just be my overactive psychologically bound like imagination. I think, I think we all want it. I think I want, I like on some level I don't cause like, I don't, I don't need to cry more, but also I really want to see people dealing with Wally more. Right. Uh, but going back to that moment from, from private security that is such a quick moment compared to like everything happening in that episode and that episode being such a hilarious episode for most of it but it has like that and it has the Zatanna Zatara gut punch that has been haunting us this whole season uh I just like do you have any thoughts about like how Young Justice balances both of those things like doing the humor and the emotional stuff uh at the same time Yes, I mean, that is, I think Private Security is my favorite episode of the entire series. Um, I could be biased, of course, because I do love me the Harper Men, but that balance. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> don't we all? Um, but that balance was just so fantastic because you have, you know, we get to see Dad Will and he's such a dork and he's running his business and he's doing great things for himself. And then, oh, wait, it's also Zatanna and Zatara having a reunion and like I listened to to this podcast about it and essentially like when I think it was Rich mentioned about that this episode was all about fatherhood and I'm like oh yeah that makes sense and it was a really good balance and you know you come to expect like oh the Harper plot is going to be funny the Zatanna Zatara plot is going to be sad, which is, and then, so you're watching it. And I remember I was watching it for the first time and being like with, you know, with a huge smile on my face with, you know, Dick attempting to beat Brick with a 
flashlight. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and it's like, you it's know, all it's, he has, it's all he had, you know, flashlight put forward. It, it works. It works in the Young Justice verse as weapons. Um, but, you know, so, you know, one moment he's doing that and I have a big smile on my face and I was like, oh, this is great. And then all of a sudden he calls Will Wall and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no here come the emotions again <laughs> and it's like, oh no we've been betrayed we were lulled into a false sense of security on young justice again security haha <laughs> um no but then if this, and this is the first instance that we've actually seen dick grieve this season about wally or at all if you don't count the ending of season two where he tells calder he needs some time um, yeah it's like oh wait here's a here's our lair this is like a moment where we realize dick still has some you know working out to do within his feelings about wally's death and it's playing out into it like it didn't occur to me that that was the reason why he was pushing back away from what will be known as the outsiders and i was like yeah. oh okay it's because of his grieving that he is pushing them away yeah and that wonderful way that Young Justice lets those emotions like drive the plot. Right. Uh, and make those like plot heavy decisions, but they're based in like characters' emotional choices. And it's just so good. Uh, but other than us just saying, why is it so good? Why do you as a writer think it's important to include stuff like this in your work? Oh, it's very important because without <laughs> these emotional bonds that we have without these emotional scenes why would we care if everything is all happy glory or if things are you know if you just been like if instead of the will and jade scene you just been told oh yeah jade comes by every now and then but she never stays so when we see these things it makes us it gives us like a big insight into oh wait it puts us in the moment this is what's going on and here is why we should care. It adds a new layer to the characters. And the best example that I can think of in this show is I want to talk about Super Martian's first kiss versus Brylet's first kiss because you have um, terrors and such a Super Martian heavy episode. And you have, yes. it wasn't even coded as a romantic episode for them it was just the two of them going on a mission but then they have that quasi therapy session <laughs> with Hugo it's, Strange <laughs> it is a therapy session it just it's yes <laughs> McGann makes it productive for them <laughs> so we have that and then you know Connor's outburst to McGann and he's like you know you're just sitting there like, oh my, wait, this is serious. How could they get together now? And then, but you have these, all these things that have happened in this episode to build up to it, to the point of, you know, her being frozen, Connor, like, finally realizing, like, he needs to, like, make a move here and now because he, um, he thinks, at least, that he almost lost him again, and then he kisses her. And then, thus we all start shipping Super Martian because they are now together and we have the background to do so in which we care about them. Then there's Briolet, which is their cute couple. I won't say they're... For, for those at home who might not know, uh, Briolet is Brion and Violet. We, t we try not to assume that anyone knows automatically all of our shipping terminology. <laughs> we've, right. we've used, I've used Super Martian enough that I feel people probably know who that is. But for anyone at home who might be confused, Brion and Halo are known as Briolet <laughs> on the internet. I think there's a name for them too. I think it's Halo Force as well, but I like Briolet, so that's what I'm going to go with. Um, but for example, their first kiss in yeah. uh, the episode Nightmare Monkeys, and they, so unlike Super Martian, they did not have, this episode was not about them in any way, shape, or form. It was mostly about Beast Boy and his, like, psychological mind games that he was has as a result of the chip and the mind monkey and whatnot. And all of a sudden, we just get a cutaway from Beast Boy and Perdita kissing, um, again, and Connor kissing, and then, boom, all of a sudden, Brion and Violet are kissing, too. And it leaves the viewer potentially a little disappointed that, oh, well, that wasn't 
co- like there was no background to this kiss. They were just doing it. And to me personally, at least as an audience member, I don't feel as strong as a tie to the couple as opposed to the season one relationships where they were built up over so many episodes. But yeah. I don't discredit that they will give me more reasons to fully ship them in the future. I don't that, doubt it. I feel like more is, but at comparing their first kisses, at least this is why it's important to have these emotional buildups because super Martian hands down. Yes. By that episode, fully shipping them can do versus Brion and Violet. It's like, I'm going to need a bit more before I yeah. commit to them. Like Rich, Rich and I have not yet had a chance to fully break down Nightmare Monkeys. We're actually at the time of this recording. We're going to be recording that tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so I'm excited to talk about that. And I have been thinking for a while since seeing that episode about how Brion and Violet they don't get to have that build up. We do see them flirting a little bit in previous episodes, but the fact that like I know me and a lot of other fans were like, but wait, what? How did this kiss happen? We don't we don't know who kissed who. We don't know how this happened. What were you talking about? Why were you outside? I have questions and you haven't answered them. Um, I, but I agree. I think the reason that a lot of people felt a little disappointed in that compared to previous seasons is just because the show has done so much good in building up other ships in the past of showing you over a long period of time over multiple episodes and giving these characters that wonderful focus in previous seasons to like make you care like even the fact that with the Superboy and Miss Martian kiss in my 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 personal favorite episode uh dares you the two episodes leading up to that even are like bereft where they almost kiss and they don't uh and leave you as the viewer me as the viewer just screaming about like <laughs> why didn't you kiss and then you get targets where that's just kind of hanging over their heads and they're just kind of dealing with it and then you get terrors where you get the payoff for all of that leading up to it whereas nightmare monkeys like i completely forgot <laughs> Halo and Brion were were flirting in the background until we cut back to them. And it's because everything else happening that, in that episode is so wonderful and so well handled and really emotional. Uh, like Beast Boy dealing with all of his trauma, getting a whole episode to deal with his trauma is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just I have my fingers crossed that we'll get to see more of Brion and Violet being really cute so that I can fully, fully ship them even more. <laughs> I agree with you. It's probably coming. Yeah, but just comparing the two, this is why it's important to have build-up. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's so good. And I think think Young Justice does such a good job that I'm not worried. I'm not worried about the two of them. I'm like, oh, you're going to give me something later. This is just, this is just the setup. Because like, Jade, Jade and Roy have their first kiss where I'm just like, oh, this is fun, whatever. And then we move on. And now I'm just like, I'm just going to cry until you two are in the same house again. <laughs> I'm worried. I'm worried of what's going to happen. But that's fine. We, we're all worried. Young Justice leaves everyone just in a perpetual state of worry. That's just how it is. Great. Because when I was watching, <laughs> when I was watching the first half of season three, um, because of press access, I actually had access to all of bringing back Young Justice as well. Um, So I low-key knew what was coming in the first 13 episodes, like, not in specifics, but like, I was like, oh, okay, we're gonna get an episode that does this and that, and I knew this was coming, Uh, but now the latter half, now I'm going in blind, so now I'm really, (laughs) and this is when stuff is gonna go down for real. (laughs) Uh, But it'll be, it'll be a great ride. It'll be, it'll be amazing, but... uh... Before we head out, do you have anything else that you want to add that you want to make sure our listeners hear about? Any other opinions you want to throw out there about Young Justice and all of our emotions? I'm trying to think about that for a second. <laughs> um, let's see. Hmm. I think we've covered just about everything. Oh, I didn't talk about, I feel like I'm going to get flat because I didn't talk about Wally's death much, at least in this recording. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, so Wally's death is a bit of a difficult topic for a lot of fans, especially considering um, the emotional impact that, you know, everyone loves Wally. I've met very few people who didn't like Young Justice's iteration of Wally. And he has a yeah. 
place in our hearts. And the death hit hard for a lot of fans. But I feel like it's been talked about so frequently. And at this point in the season, it's also unclear if he's returning or not. And I don't want to, I'm just going to knock on wood and say, I'm not going to talk about Wally's death because he's <laughs> coming back and <laughs> is what I'm going to put into the universe. I- I'd be okay if he didn't, because I do also respect that as a writer, sometimes you want death to be final um, and you don't want to minimize that emotional impact of that. But at the same time, my, spit li- my Spitfire loving heart is like, yeah, 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 for sure. Wally's coming back and Artemis is going to be great. And who's Will? There's no such thing as Artemis and Will getting together. They're, they're, Wally's fine. He's coming back. It's fine. Everything's fine. We're fine. <laughs> All fine. And Andy. Um, but yes. on, on that very hopeful note, <laughs> uh, I think we should probably start wrapping things up. So thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower, Ariel. Uh, where can people find you uh, here on Earth Prime? So you can find me on Twitter, Ariel Horn 10. Uh, you can find me on youngjustice.tv. We release new articles every week, the same as the YJ files. So we call it our Whelmed Wednesdays. Um, you can also find me on Tumblr, whose username you should probably link below because I'm not sure if it's very family friendly. <laughs> Yeah, and I just also want to mention the Crash the Mode campaign that's currently going on. Uh, yeah. And Dids and I came up with this campaign, and then we got a bunch of people in on it as well. Um, and basically, it's not so much as bring back Injustice for another season, which, of course, we want, and that is our... It is a motive, but it's not our biggest motive. We do want to just wake up the fandom, get the love for Young Justice going, and now we are we are officially 30 days out from the return of season three. So we want to, you know, rouse the fandom a little bit, start rewatching the episodes. We're going to have Twitter hashtags. We have at least three times a week. We have a binge going on. We have a bunch of, you know, sharing sessions. It's going to be fun. Yeah. I know we've, we've seen a couple of things (laughs) over on Twitter and Whelmed has been sharing some of the stuff that we see and it looks awesome. You guys have been super organized about it and it's going to be great. I can't wait to see where it goes. Yes. Thanks so much for helping promote it. Of course. We love sharing what the Young Justice fandom is doing right now. And if it's this, this is a pretty good thing to be sharing. (laughs) So Thank you to everyone for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, a couple of other places too, probably. <laughs> and if that's not enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. because we have to look a little harder to find those. And finally, if you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even just $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and a whole lot more. And as always, stay well, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.